Uh, John Climacus says this, Demons fear concentration as thieves fear dogs. Hmm. Demons fear concentration, meaning they fear concentration, clarity, focus in Christians as thieves fear dogs. In other words, clarity is the enemy of the enemy. Clarity for Christians. Clarity is the enemy of the enemy. Now, now, what is meant by that? Well, Jesus, in John 8, 44, he, he describes the devil and he calls him the father of lies. The father of lies. So his strategy is deception. It is confusion. It is, it is distraction. It is all these things so that we might not focus on Jesus, that we might not focus on his word and his love and his goodness and the priorities to which he calls us. So when we get distracted from that, the enemy makes inroads and has limited power. And so there was a group of Christians in the first century uh, who were struggling with just this thing. They had, they had lost their focus. They had lost their concentration. And as a result, the enemy was making inroads. And those Christians were called the Colossians. And so Paul, the apostle, out of love and concern and care for these people, writes a letter to them to help them regain that concentration and clarity and focus. And so the things that he tells them then are also helpful for us today. Demons fear concentration as thieves fear dogs. And so we are beginning this series on the book of Colossians. It's a very short book in the New Testament. Uh, in my edition, it's only like three pages, so it uh, doesn't take very long uh, to read. But we're going to highlight a few of the details that make up the background of this, because we're going to go through this entire book line by line over the next several weeks. Now, who wrote it? As I said, the apostle Paul wrote it. Technically, he and a co-worker named Timothy wrote it. Um, but uh, really, Paul is the main author. It uses the first person. Uh, where did he write it from? Well, he writes it from prison. It might be that he writes it from Rome. It could be Ephesus. It's hard to be sure. Um, but what do we know about these concerns here? So, so the church in Colossae, so the Colossians, you know, are from Colossae. Uh, we know that that's in modern Turkey. So just to kind of geographically orient yourselves. Uh, and the year that he wrote is probably between 60 and 62, so these are in the early years. The church is expanding and growing uh, after the resurrection of Jesus. And <clears throat> uh, so it's a modern-day Turkey, and it's probably a young church, about 10 years old, right? So they're not very old as a congregation uh, yet. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, this picture is one of a, archaeologists call this a tell. And that big mound in the background is the ancient city of Colossae. Uh, it is yet to be excavated, which is pretty interesting because it's a biblical site, so it's a um, it's a, a point of interest. This picture is from Biola University. Uh, but excavations are actually just now starting on Colossae. So it's interesting. What are they going to find? They'll find stuff that will tell us about the world of Paul and, and the first apostles. And who knows? They might even discover an ancient manuscript, right, of, uh, uh, of, the, of this very letter. So what's going on there? What are their concerns if they have lost their focus? Well, it's hard to be sure, uh, right? But Paul gives us a bit of an indication in chapter 2, verse 8. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according uh, to Christ. And so we'll start to unpack some of that as we go in. It's hard to assure exactly what's going on, but, but what is the main theme? What is the main focus? Well, because they've lost that concentration, the main theme is the supremacy of Jesus. It's the supremacy of Jesus, who he is, what he has done. And okay, he is Lord over all. He is Lord of not only the physical realm, but the invisible spiritual realm. And when you lose track of that, other things at home, at church, in the world, every, things start to disintegrate when we lose that focus about who Jesus is and what he has done. The great reformer John Calvin at this point says, the letter distinguishes the true Christ from a fictitious one. What? What do you mean? Well, sometimes people can think they're following Jesus, but they're following a certain version of Jesus that they have created to their own liking. The political right co-ops a version of Jesus for their cause. 
The liberal left co-ops a version of Jesus for their cause. And we all need to be guarding against this because it's easy to do. Kyle Eidelman has a word for this. He says, uh, when, when you pick and choose different things, I like this part of Jesus, I don't like that part, I'm going to take this and leave that. He said, you're not honoring Jesus, you're honoring Mises. You're just projecting things that you already want onto Jesus. Right, And so what is going on? Who is Jesus according to Scripture that we might follow him? So uh, with that, we're going to look at the first 14 verses uh, today. So it's a smaller chunk of text. But, and I'm reading from the ESV, but what I'd like to say is we're going to move into a very practical application to start today. Okay, So we're going to look at the first 14 verses. And it has to do with a very important theme that we're going to return to after we look at the text, which is that we are walking the narrow road the narrow path, okay? The Colossians were walking the narrow path. It is the only path. It is a beautiful path. It is a good path. It is a loving path. And it is a difficult path, let's be honest. And so Paul is going to say things to them that we learn for ourselves for the narrow path. Demons fear concentration as thieves fear dogs. All right, so let's open it up to Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, let's get into it. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Okay, so Paul identifies himself as an apostle. It literally means one who is sent. Okay? Now, it also carries a sense of authority, so he is identifying himself as an authoritative person, messenger sent from God. Now, he addresses this to uh, brothers, but it's a generic term. It's brothers and sisters, so men and women who are at the church in Colossae. It also says saints, so he's reminding them about who they are. Now, this isn't capital S saint, someone on the wall who has a halo around their head and a nice painting, although it includes that too. In the New Testament, a saint simply means the holy ones. That's you. If you're a follower of Jesus, holy doesn't mean better than other people. It means you are set apart for a distinct godly purpose. And so by calling them saints, he's reminding them, you are the ones who God has chosen to be set apart for a distinct godly purpose. Verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Okay, so they're doing this way. They're loyal to Jesus. They're, they're being very loving because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now, hope is a very powerful thing. It can motivate us. Uh, last year, in the lead up to Easter, Ben and I were talking about hope, and we came up with a definition that we think is true to the Bible. Uh, and it's on this sign out there at the church. Hope is knowing that better is coming. Right? Hope is knowing that better is coming. And that works backwards into our lives to help us and to change our, our posture and our actions. <clears throat> and there's an expression out there. Um, some people are, maybe you've heard it, some people are so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly use. Have you heard that? Yeah. Some people are so heavenly, and that expression really gets at, you know, some people, are, they got their head in the clouds. They're really useless here on earth. Um, but for Christians, the opposite should be the case. If people are actually heavenly minded, they should be of consistent earthly use because what we know about, you know, the kingdom come should work backwards into our lives, into the here and now, right? Our lives are to be a, a foreshadowing of that great and glorious uh, world that is to come. All right, continuing. In verse 5, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit." So, pause. Here we are really understanding kind of the, the nature of their relationship. So there's clearly a co-worker named Epaphras. Uh, he is um, a co-worker with Paul. He has helped them, and he's the one who has brought the message of their progress back to Paul. But notice a couple things. He, he is commending them for bearing fruit. And it's just good to pause and remember what that is. It means showing evidence of your faith. 
right? To hear and not do is to not hear. So we hear and we, and we do. And so I think he's specifically refer- referencing the fact that they're showing love because he mentions the word love twice uh, in this section uh, of text. Verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. And he's going to mention seven things, and we'll return to these. We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit, there's that phrase again, in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Clearly, knowledge is important to him because it echoes verse 9. It's the second time he's mentioned that. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. The word for endurance could be steadfastness as well. So not just endurance, but endurance with joy. Not just patience, but patience with joy. And then finally, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. How beautiful is this expression. You have an inheritance because of Jesus. What do people inherit? Someone passes away and they inherit the cottage, a boat, a watch, whatever. Here he's saying that in Christ we have a spiritual inheritance. And so the phrase that we have used in the past is spiritual billionaires. Think think about what you get through Christ that you cannot get any other place. First of all, identity. You become a child of God. You are adopted into the household of God, something which does not happen outside of faith in Christ. You you receive the covenant promises of God, eternal life in the presence of God. You, you, You inherit forgiveness and peace with God, peace with the God of heaven and earth, something we cannot get otherwise. You you receive and inherit a life of purpose and meaning as the hands and feet of Jesus. You you inherit glory, all these incredible, beautiful things. All of which we get in Christ. No wonder Paul is commending them for their faith, which they now have. Verse 13, then he says, He, God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, meaning Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of of sins. Wow, so earlier he talked about the word of truth or the gospel. So here he gives an expression of it. This is right at the heart of that gospel good news message, okay? So he has transferred us. So previously, outside of Jesus, we were actually in the domain of darkness. So we might have been nice people, done nice things, but we are in the domain of darkness. And he transfers us, he does it, not us, into the kingdom of his beloved son. I remember one time going past a construction site. And there was this <clears throat> excavator, and there was this pile of rocks that were being pulled out of the muck and, and being put into this other pile, you know, the big scoop, uh, for some other better purpose. And I know it's kind of a, you know, a base level analogy, but it's always stuck with me. It's like that's God transferring us out of the muck into the kingdom of light, he, something he does um, that we don't do. All right, so we end our look at the text there. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so uh, let's focus our attention on this idea. Paul knows that he is more spiritually mature than them. That's, that's not being arrogant. It's not being rude. He knows he is more spiritually mature. He's an ambassador sent from God, okay? And so he takes an interest in them out of their love. He knows that he is operating from a position of maturity. He sees them veering off the ditch a little bit, and so he takes an interest. He knows that they need coaches, He knows that they need encouragers and cheerleaders. He knows that they need someone who is so honest with them that he will call them on their waywardness and on the problems. It's not because he's being mean. It's because he loves them. And so just as he does that for them, we need that as well. They need this mature voice in their lives. Yes, they have that spiritual life. They need cultivation, fertilization, encouragement, knowledge. Uh, The great Puritan biblical commentator, Matthew Henry, says, where there is spiritual life, there is still need for spiritual strength. There is still need for spiritual strength, strength for all the actions of the spiritual life. Okay? So faith is a team sport, not just an individual sport. 
And so Paul knows that, and so recognizing his position of maturity and knowledge, he's coming in because those other people need other people. And this is especially important because of what I said about the narrow path. You know what? Remember where that comes from? It comes from the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous religious teaching all over the world. Jesus, Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14, enter by the narrow gate. And this is, this is said in the context, meaning it applies to everyone. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. You see, if it wasn't a narrow road, Paul would be like, well, they're fine. It doesn't matter. If the path were supposed to be wide, then they really wouldn't need help because the way is broad and anything, anything goes. It would be okay to devalue Jesus, to not appreciate his supremacy, because the road's wide. Who cares? It'd be okay to blend into the culture. It'd be okay to cherry-pick certain parts about Jesus, because the road is broad and wide. It's easy. It, it would be okay, you know, for, for us to just be apathetic towards our neighbors and not, you know, work at being loving and Christ-like. It's because the road is wide. Like, who cares? Like, the way's easy, Right? But of course it's not. The way is not wide and easy. It is a narrow path. The Colossians needed help as we do. So it's not just about knowing which road to take, but taking the road and persevering on the road by the grace of God. All these different things together. And so Paul's prayer actually reveals to us several things that are essential and helpful on the narrow path. And so let's look at them one by one. We're going to put them up here, put these seven categories up here. Um, and remember that prayers are... Prayers reveal what real priorities are, right? Now, Paul is an apostle. He's an authoritative messenger from God. It's in the Word of God, so we know this is authoritative. But I think it reveals something of our hearts. If I could have a, you know, some, some, some way, you know, mysteriously look into everyone's hearts and see the things you pray for consistently, those are the things that are your ultimate priorities, right? The things we pray for consistently. These are the things Paul is praying for them, that they may have knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, Yep, verse 9, narrow road. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Verse 10, yep, narrow road. Bear fruit or give evidence in every good work. He's referring to love, verse 10. Increase in the knowledge of God, verse 10. Again, that reiterates verse 9, narrow road. Next. That they are strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might. Verse 11, narrow road. It's not our power, it's his. Have endurance and patience with joy, verse 11. Yeah. We need that for the narrow road. Show gratitude to God, verse 12, on the narrow road, absolutely. And so if you and I are going to get help with this, we need people. That's one of the things that undergirds this entire letter, the fact that he actually takes an interest in them. It's a narrow road. It's difficult. They're, they're swerving off. They're forgetting who Jesus is and, and his significance. So they need that correction. And so people on the narrow path need people on the narrow path. People on the narrow path need people on the narrow path. Because just think about it. If you're on this narrow path and it's challenging, um, it helps to, to interact with people and, and, to, and to fellowship with people um, and to benefit from other people who maybe you're sharing some of the same goals in life. You might have different personalities, different careers, different trajectories in school, um, different parts of the world, some different customs, but share some of the same goals. Uh, also, people who will probably experience some of the same struggles with you because of those same goals. So they can relate to you and encourage you and strengthen you in ways that other people will not be able to. Further, you can share your setbacks and your frustrations because although there will be difference, I'm guessing that those people are going to at least be able to relate to some of the things that you are experiencing. People on the narrow path need people on the narrow path. Now, two questions as we figure out what our specific practical next steps are. Here they are. And the first is, do you need the help of a more mature Christian who is also walking the narrow path? Sometimes we think this is an individual sport. If I ask a question, that means I'm dumb. No, it's okay. Um, and maybe this is just a, a reminder, like, okay, but maybe there's someone is struggling with this with me, and although they're different, they have a similar goal in life, and I need to connect with them, and so maybe this is going to be an encouragement to you. Second question, are you the mature Christian who needs to help someone else? 
what if Paul and Christ and other people with spiritual maturity in the Bible were actually setting us an example, not only because of what they wrote, but because they actually take the initiative to get involved in someone's life when they see something is is happening that's wrong, and, and they do it because they care. Now, as we think through kind of where we fit in these questions, I want to give us three things uh, to consider that will help us discern. And the first is, well, most of us are probably thinking, yeah, I'm probably in that first category, right? We, we need the help of more mature Christians, and, and that's a humble thing to say, and that's accurate, because all of us, including myself, you know, we're on the journey. We've got so much to learn, so much growth. You know, I'll put my hand up first, absolutely. So, yeah, a lot of us, to some degree, are in that category. But at the same time, As we think about it, as it relates to the second category, maybe you're thinking, well, yeah, maybe I might have some wisdom or maturity to to share, but that doesn't sound very proud. Sorry, that sounds kind of proud or arrogant, so, so, so maybe not. Well, hold on. Very humble. But it might be the case that you do actually have some maturity that other people will specifically benefit from on the narrow path. And I want to give us four quick considerations. I'm just going to run through them quick. I'll share them online this week. But these are potential signs of spiritual maturity. First, that you have a firm faith that is loving and rooted in biblical truth. So firm faith, not easily shaken. And you're loving, you're bearing evidence. That's a consistent theme in the New Testament. Bearing evidence of, of, of love. And it's rooted in biblical truth. So, so you're not committed to Mises or, or some you know, contorted version of Jesus. You're firmly rooted in this loving faith in the footsteps of, of, of the actual Christ of Scripture. Second, you are consistent in spiritual practices. So this is a sign of spiritual maturity. Worship, Bible reading, prayer, acts of servanthood. Worship, Bible reading, prayer, acts of servanthood. You're consistent with these things. So that's a second sign. A third sign of spiritual maturity is that you have kept the faith through life's ups and downs for an extended period of time. This is something about longevity. Okay, so, okay, I've had the ups, I've had the downs, I've had the mountaintops, I've had the valleys, but I've kept the faith through it. That is a sign of spiritual maturity. And fourth and finally, others sometimes come to you for advice. Not always, but sometimes. You're you're the type of person who says things that are helpful to other people on the narrow path. So there's other signs, but those are four. And the third consideration is that this is about fellowship. Just sometimes the categories of who needs the maturity and who is the more mature one are not so cut and dry. Sometimes it's just about fellowship. I just want to be with someone who's experiencing something that I'm, oh, it's, it's hard in the workplace these days and there's stress and I'm walking the narrow path. I just need to talk to someone and connect with someone who, who kind of knows what I'm going through. Or there's parents, hey, you know what? The craziness, the insanity, the deception in the world right now, raising kids, I just need to talk to someone else who is going through this craziness and we need to connect. Or maybe there's a group of older Christians, quote unquote older, I'll let you define what that means, I don't want to get into that. (laughs) And maybe you're in a new transition, a new life stage, and that has altered your relationship somehow and you're and you're struggling with it, and you need to connect with someone who's, who's there and, and, and who just knows something of maybe what you're going through. Do you need the help of a more mature Christian who is also walking the narrow path, or are you the more, Christi- more mature Christian who needs to help someone else? Because people on the narrow path need people on the narrow path. People who go through battle together uh, bond. Uh, There's people who study this. Uh, There's a solidarity. There's a unity. Uh, Imagine some of the soldiers who survived um, the beaches of Normandy. Imagine imagine that. Imagine surviving that. There there is a strong bond and a connection, even as those people uh, go to other parts of the world, even as they experience different things, different health challenges, setbacks, careers, everything else. There is a bond. In one study from another part of the world, It said that 45% of soldiers felt more connected to their fellow soldiers than they did to their biological families. And that that number is higher for people who are actually in armed conflict on the front lines. Almost half are more connected. Harvey Whitehouse, lead author of the study from Oxford University, says, This research suggests that the old adage about bonding in adversity is true. And I think this extends to other parts of life as well. One of the categories 
uh, that came to my mind was probably nurses in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, that's, that's a kind of a front line. And um, long hours, uh, stress, uh, changing regulations, uh, uncertainty, exposure to death, people are dying. You know, I'm guessing that those nurses who went through that together kind of have a pretty good bond. And then, of course, there's the people of Jesus. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. Those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Paul was proactive about helping the Colossians. They needed help on the narrow path. And what he says to them is also helpful to us. People on the narrow path need people on the narrow path. Maturity is meant to be shared. Let's journey through Colossians together. Praise be to God. Amen.